Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. My name is David Talbot, Managing Director and Head of Research here at Red Cloud Securities, and I'm delighted to host a Red Cloud webinar on uranium today. We will hear from Encore Energy Management, including Bill Sheriff, the Executive Chairman, and Paul Gornson, CEO. Now, during today's webinar, they will provide an overview and outlook, and then we'll take some questions. You can type your questions in the chat box at any time, and we'll get to as many as we can. But before we kick things off, we first we need to discuss the fine print. During this Encore Energy webinar, forward-looking statements may be made. I would direct listeners to its forward-looking statements outlined on page two of the corporate presentation. That can be found on the company's website, EncoreEnergyCorp.com. For Red Cloud Securities, Inc., I would highlight this webinar is for information purposes only. It should not be considered a solicitation or recommendation to buy or sell securities. We note this call does not consider the particular situation or need of individual investors. Participants should rely on their own investigation and seek their own professional advice before investing. So please see our most recent research located on the Red Cloud website for specific disclosures on Encore Energy. Now, ongoing news from the Ukraine and fear of Russian uranium and enrichment disruption seem to have dissipated somewhat. Sprott buying has slowed and uranium prices have been somewhat stable. You know, uranium did start the year at 40 bucks a pound. It did surpass 63 bucks a pound in April, at the, which has been the highest price since March 20, uh, 2011. However, it's since settled back and has remained flat, roughly around 47.75 a pound for a couple of weeks now. Bottom line, we still like the fundamentals for driving prices higher. With disinvestment in the uranium sector, there has been lack of exploration, lack of discoveries, and new mines will be needed in coming years to replace mine closures, let alone cover the growth in uranium demand. Uh, uranium demand that even the uh, Japanese say will be needed. And that's one reason why we uh, see the uranium, uh, the uranium sector hot over the last couple of days. Japan's you know, essentially doubling down, saying they're, uh, they're going to be opening reactors within the year. So with that, I will turn it over to Bill and Paul to update the audience on Encore. Take it away, guys. Thank you. I'm Bill Sheriff, the Executive Chairman. I'll get things started here and then hand it off to uh, our CEO, Paul Gorenson, for a more of a technical uh, deep dive. Encore Energy is a U.S.-focused company. We're 100% dedicated to in-situ recovery of uranium. The disclaimer David had mentioned. Yeah, we're, we're a very unique company in that uh, we've got a very, very long history of uh, involvement and success in the uranium industry. Basically, we're combining two teams, uh, that of, uh, with Paul, the uh, Alta Mesa uh, Mustania Uranium uh, company and plant that was put into production during the last boom you can see in 2006-07, uh, where he's actually able to uh, build and construct a plant under budget in about 11 or 12 months and uh, end up selling uranium into the spot market, being one of the only uh, uh, sellers into that spot market during that supply constraint time. Uh, also, uh, very, very many years involved with uh, the industry through a number of other uh, companies, including Cameco, uh, resources where he's president and uh, Rio Algam. On the other side, uh, we've combined the team, much of the technical team of Energy Metals Corp. I uh, was a founder of, a co founder of that and chairman. Uh, we went on to amass the largest uh, resource base in US history before selling out to Uranium One. So these two teams combining really puts us in an excellent position along with the a sound portfolio of properties to uh, exploit and deliver on uh, the promise of production of uranium uh, from domestic sources. We're, we're in an ideal time. You know, I mentioned the earlier time where uranium had boomed in the uh, 05, 06, 07 timeframe. That was largely a constraint on supply. What we have now, though, is uh, not only a, a constrained supply, we have uh, supply line interruptions with the Ukrainian situation. Well, it may have left our 72-hour uh, uh, news cycle in the U.S. It's certainly uh, still ever present and uh, uh, there don't seem to be any solutions on the table for that with over half of the uh, U.S. supply of uh, uranium going through the Port of St. Petersburg or, or rather stopped at the Port of St. Petersburg. It's really a, a significant uh, disruption. Uh, in addition to the uh, really firm uh, backdrop of uh, 
a renewal of desire for energy, uh, nuclear energy, as well as many plants being built. It's uh, almost daily that you hear of another, another country that's uh, commissioning new plants in addition to uh, those uh, slated by China and Russia. So we're really looking at a huge increase in demand, especially with the green EV uh, and a disruption of supply and a constrained supply. So it's a, really a perfect storm emerging and we're really in the early innings of the uranium business uh, cycle. Uh, at Encore, we're focusing uh, all of our efforts on our South Texas Rosita plant. We do have two plants that are fully licensed in the U.S., uh, Rosita and Kingsville. Rosita has been undergoing modernization the last uh, year and is, will be ready for its production in 2023. We do have contracts, so uh, the, the plant uh, is, has been almost fully refurbished. The well fields are, are being installed. Uh, most recently just announced the completion of our monitor well ring, which is a, a key step in, in uh, getting into the... Uh, 2023 delivery of our contracts. Uh, we also have a, a very significant uh, pipeline of projects, uh, not only a number of projects on a satellite hub and spoke arrangement, if you will, uh, in South Texas uh, that will feed Rosita for many years to come, uh, but also significant advanced projects with Gas Hills in Wyoming and Dewey Burdock in South Dakota, and then a, a, a commanding uh, situation in the uranium industry in New Mexico, which is our long-term storehouse of value. Here again, the in-situ recovery, our focus is entirely uh, on in-situ, not conventional, primarily because of the uh, environmental benefits or, or uh, environmental friendliness of the extractive method, uh, as well as uh, on, on the recovery and reclamation, uh, much more simple, straightforward, and, and lower capex, far favorable. More, more than half the world's uranium is done in-situ, so that's certainly where we're going to focus. Mentioned Paul's background and, and uh, some of the team. We've got an elite team all the way through with many, many years of experience. I'll get into that a bit uh, later, but I'd put our ISR team up against anyone in the industry, uh, certainly outside of Kazakhstan anyway, in terms of uh, bench strength and depth. And that's certainly going to benefit us as we uh, move into production. Uh, our uranium sales strategy, we've already been able to uh, enlist a number of contracts with uh, nuclear uh, utilities. And uh, we continue to stage those uh, through uh, the coming decade. Uh, we also have a very strong uh, asset uh, divert, uh, divestiture of our non-core assets and have uh, already implemented uh, our ongoing merger and acquisition strategy, having completed two major mergers within the past two years. First being uh, the assets of uranium resources, which was owned by Westwater. Second being the consolidation of Azarga uranium, which brought us the uh, aforementioned uh, Dewey Burdock, South Dakota project and Gas Hills, Wyoming project. A little bit on the company, our market cap is a 450 million Canadian. Uh, we do have uh, about 16 million US in cash, and that does not include our derivative uh, options on uh, 300,000 pounds of uranium. Board of directors, uh, we do have one uh, change there, but you can see a, a great deal of uh, experience in terms of years there in, in the business. Uh, Nate T. Walt did step down to move on to our advisory board and I uh, was replaced by uh, Susan Hoxie Key, who is uh, a nuclear engineer and brings us uh, the unique uh, uh, viewpoint of, of, a, of the customer. Uh, many years uh, working in fuel procurement and uh, reactor design, fuel design for the Southern company, who's uh, currently the uh, in the completing stages of the two nuclear reactors under construction in the U.S. So her insight uh, fully rounds out our board's experience. I'd point out a couple of people on there other than uh, the ones I've mentioned. Uh, Dr. Stover is one of the original pioneers, one of the uh, original inventors of the ISR project. Uh, Mark Paliza, 40 years in the ISR business, uh, about half in permitting, half in operations. Our, our strong management team, Peter Luthiger, our chief operating officer, uh, worked with Paul at uh, Alta Mesa, Mustania, and a number of other uh, uh, positions as well. Uh, Greg Zerzon just joined us as our chief administrative officer. He was a uh, principal deputy solicitor of the U.S. Department of Interior, where he's basically head of the legal department over the U.S. lands. Brings us a great deal of uh, insight there. Also a deep background in uh, uh, financial uh, derivatives and what and investments while he was at uh, Koch Brothers. Carrie Merke, our, CF, our chief financial officer, uh, brings uh, experience as well, having worked with Paul at Cameco. And Gordon Peake, our director of lands, uh, 40 years in the uh, minerals exploration business. 
Advisory board, as I mentioned, uh, very well-established people, including Blake Steele, who was the CEO of Azarga, who serves as our Asian liaison. Uh, Nate Tewalt, as I mentioned, Eugene Spearing, deep, deep uh, experience in the uranium industry, Joe Arrington in uh, many aspects of uh, mineral extraction and uh, primarily reclamation. As I mentioned, the backdrop here, you can just go on and on. You could talk for hours on just the uh, positive backdrop, but the bipartisan support uh, the most recent bill putting in uh, real incentives for nuclear energy. Uh, first time in many years, perhaps 50 years, since we've had bipartisan support in the U.S. for nuclear energy. Uh, obviously, we need a domestic supply. The, the last few years, the U.S. has produced uh, less than 2% uh, of its needs and heavily, heavily reliant upon uh, countries such as Kazakhstan and Russia. And uh, we simply have to develop uh, our own sources of, of uranium feed. Uh, the Department of Energy here again is uh, reviewing the critical nature of it. Um, a nuclear Fuel Working Group, the U.S. has put out uh, its first bid for uh, uranium from domestic sources. And uh, those are supposed to be announced here within the next month or two. Paul can give you a bit more detail on that. Um, obviously, the carbon-free air quality, all of these things are key factors uh, motivating the uh, renewal of uh, nuclear energy. Talking about the global environment, uh, here again, not only is it the U.S., not only is it the green and the EV uh, demand that's going to increase electrical demand, uh, it is the entire world is going nuclear. With over 200 nuclear reactors uh, in the planning stages are under construction. Literally, it's daily. Today, I, I noticed uh, Poland's talking about six new reactors. Uh, you just see uh, literally almost every day, certainly every week, new reactors being uh, ordered online, commissioned, and licensed. Uh, but the big news, of course, uh, in the last week or two was Japan not only uh, restarting their reactors, but uh, planning to build additional reactors. So this really is, is a huge shift. It wasn't that many years ago Japan was liquidating their uranium resources uh, after Fukushima, and that's turned from a, a, a significant headwind to a very, very strong tailwind. So that's uh, that's helping us as well. Keep in mind the U.S. 20 percent of, uh, of our energy is generated through nuclear power. And you're seeing uh, many places that had talked about phasing out nuclear power, uh, renewing it. Germany, for one, California, uh, a very consistent theme across the world as, uh, as energy uh, supplies are constrained and, and green power is uh, becoming the word of the day. Nuclear industry, obviously, uh, small modular reactors are another effect that's going to really enhance us. Uh, they use a little bit more enriched fuel. Uh, that's the uh, high assay. Uh, low enriched uh, fuel. It's about 20% instead of 5%. Uh, we're, we're going to see these, uh, you've already seen the first designs uh, put forth, and uh, it's not only in the U.S., but there's a worldwide push for these. Just another significant source. So uh, the, the industry could not be in much better shape, and we've got a very, very bright future, and certainly the best time for uranium uh, since the 1970s. So fully five decades have transpired, and now we're just in the early stages of uh, what's going to be one of the epic boom markets, I think. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Paul, and he can take you through the nuclear fuel sites and some of the details. Thanks, Bill. Uh, as you know, we're a uranium producer. We're going to be a near-term. We are a near-term pro uranium producer, so we'll be producing uranium out of South Texas. And from that, if you look at the nuclear fuel cycle, uh, we produce what's called yellow cake, which is just a raw uranium concentrate. To get that to nuclear fuel, we have to go through a few steps. The first one is conversion, where we take that uh, yellow cake and convert it to what's called a uranium hexafluoride gas. That is what is run through the enrichment plant. And in most cases, it's centrifuges like we have in New Mexico, where the heavy gas is uh, run through and the, uh, the fissionable product, is, uh, which is U-235, is concentrated uh, to uh, to to a level that, that's usable in light water reactors, which is what our nuclear fleet is in the United States. From there, that enriched uranium is then moved to uh, uh, in cylinders to a fabrication plant where they actually create the fuel rods uh, that have the uh, those very those, those uh, ceramic pellets that everybody's used to, that those who are familiar with it are used to seeing about the size of a pencil eraser. They're stacked in these tubes and uh, bundled into these uh, fuel fuel bundles that are inserted into the reactor. And ultimately, it's, it's producing power at the nuclear power plant. And this is a, a tremendous amount of energy that's generated off this. 
Uh, as a result, uh, the, the footprint of nuclear power plants is, is relatively small on a per terawatt basis. Um, usually a typical 1,000 megawatt reactor goes through about half a million pounds of uranium per year as they cycle through. Typically, it's one-third of the fuel every year is cycled through. So it's quite a bit of uranium that's consumed, but uh, on, a, on a whole, a lot of electricity that's generated. How do we get it out of the ground? Well, we use what's in situ, called in situ recovery. We are injecting ground, native groundwater beneficiated with oxygen and carbon dioxide, and that actually re, uh, recovers uranium out of the, the ore body uh, in situ. So we, we're not actually physically removing any material from the ground itself. Uh, there's no open pits or large shafts or drifts underground workings, and most notably, no tailings. Uh, and as a result, we're just basically a gigantic water treatment plant. And in this cartoon you see here, we, we load uranium. Uh, we actually inject the groundwater with oxygen into the ground where it crosses through the uranium ore body and the uranium actually goes into solution into the, as, a, as a salt, like when, when someone dissolves salt in warm water. And then it's pumped to the surface and then that uranium laden water is run through an ion exchange bed and these are resin beads, if you're familiar with water softeners, where the uranium is actually exchanged onto the resin beads and concentrated at that point. And then the, the, uh, the, the uranium-free, clear, uh, the, what we call barren lixiviant, which has no uranium, is recycled. So we're constantly recycling the water. So there's minimal water demand on the groundwater uh, as we do this. And, from, and then back into the plant, we uh, take that uranium uh, off of the resin beads, use, just like one does when they, they uh, run a water software and just take the uranium off as a concentrate. And then we do uh, some general high school chemistry and create uranium slurry where we actually run it through a filter press to rinse out the impurities. And then we run it through a rotary vacuum dryer and then package it in drums that we uh, load into a truck and ship off to the conversion facility. All this while, there's no air emissions while we're doing this. So there's no, there's, when one thinks about air quality, et cetera, uh, we have no impacts of the air quality. On the groundwater side, we have minimal impacts to the groundwater because we contain all our solutions. And that at, when we're done mining, we do go and clean up the groundwater that we've impacted so that when we walk away, everything's in the same conditions uh, that they were prior to mining. That's an important factor that you don't get to see in the conventional space, but there's large excavations, uh, et cetera. So we, we, that's why we, this is considered a much more environmentally friendly uh, method for mining. This is what our footprint looks like now. We've got projects that stretch all the way from South Dakota down to South Texas. Uh, up, starting up in South Dakota, we have Dewey Burdock, uh, which has substantial resources, 17 million pounds of measured indicator resources. Working in the Wyoming, uh, where our primary projects are, uh, we are at Gas Hills. And as you can see, we've got a large position in, in New Mexico and then down to South Texas, where, as Bill mentioned earlier, that's where we're focusing our, our first activity to start mining. And so you can see it's built on that, uh, the, the production pipeline uh, that you see to the left. Starting in Texas, building out in South Dakota and Wyoming, and ultimately to take to uh, recover our storehouse, our, our value of uranium that's out in New Mexico as we move along. In South Texas, uh, Bill mentioned that we'd use what's similar to what some have called a hub and spoke. We have remote satellite ion exchange plants. So as I described earlier about the well field where we have the injection and recovery wells, we have those that can be located remotely away from the central processing plant. And we can we use a remote ion exchange. So these plants are located right at where the, uh, the well fields are. And we move that resin from there to a licensed central processing plant. <coughs> and uh, from there, we go through the rest of the process. Encore has two fully licensed and constructed uh, in situ recovery plants, uh, one at Rosita, one at Kingsville Dome, with a combined capacity of about 1.6 million pounds per year. And we have the capability of increasing that production capacity 
higher if uh, if we decide that the economics and the and the, uh, the the production will support it. Our current production is targeted to be in 2023, and we continue to we expect to continue to expand and build our production profile as we go along over the next couple of years to really maximize our production capacity. And uh, we'll continue to evaluate expanding that capacity as we go along. But it's a it's a in, uh, in ex a low cost way uh, to recover uranium. Uh, these well fields are relatively shallow, so our costs are relatively low. And uh, the, having the production facilities fully licensed and in place already, we avoid the the cost of license the cost of uh, construction, but also we the time it takes to get these facilities licensed, which can last a couple of years, if not more. There's a little bit more on where we're targeting our initial production at uh, in South Texas. And this is at our Rosita site. It's located approximately 60 miles or 50 miles west of Corpus Christi, Texas. And uh, it's a previously operated site. It's, uh, uh, as you can see on the photograph, there's a couple of yellow highlighted areas. The one that's towards the center uh, right is what we call the Rosita Extension. And that is a previously, it's all in our current permit area, but this is where we intend to come into production first. What's not, then we ex expect to expand to a project called uh, Upper Spring Creek, which is within 40 miles of Rosita. And we'll run that as a satellite ion exchange as I described, and we'll truck haul the resin to the plant uh, to recover the uranium. And, and basically the, the resin is the primary means for transportation. It provides a high value way of uh, moving uranium uh, for a low cost basis. Uh, with this, we'll be in the production, as I said, in 2023 and continuing to expand that production capacity. Texas has a lot of growth opportunities here. Uh, we don't get to capture it fully like uh, other well exp explored areas, but uh, the USGS estimated well over 300 million pounds of undiscovered but economic resources in South Texas. We know because of our extensive database it's, and we know where those several of those deposits will be and whether it'll be economic and we're leveraging that database to get access, uh, to access those. Our Upper Spring, Spring Creek project is an ideal way, is an ideal example of where we've leveraged that data to acquire properties and to bring them quickly into production. The advantage of where we're at right now, Rosita, it's all, like I said, it's all been previously permitted and licensed. What we're working within is an area where we have minimal regulatory requirements and mitigate the significant timelines of, that uh, could be, that could uh, come from those regulatory reviews. And one of the things we did in 2022 and 2020, 2021, 2022, is we started to refurbish the and modernize the Rosita Central Processing Plant. We uh, the plant was recently updated and upgrade uh, rebuilt as a uh, central processing plant back in uh, 2008, but the work was not completed. And meanwhile, the market uh, uh, basically after Fukushima uh, was no longer considered to be economic to operate. So the, the facilities uh, stayed in standby. Uh, with no further improvements or maintenance or minimal maintenance. And so when we took it over in, at the end of 2020, uh, we immediately began the work to rebuild and uh, to extend that uh, construction uh, to be finally operated. And uh, as you can see from the photographs, there's been quite a bit of activity. Uh, the, the plant is, uh, the, the upgrades and modernization of the plant are about 99% or 95% done. There's a few items that we're, we're currently uh, uh, waiting to get in, uh, installed, a couple of pumps, et cetera. But everything's on track, and we will be on time and on budget uh, when we uh, start up in 2023. The other thing we're doing also at the same time, as Bill mentioned, we just finished up the, uh, the inst installation of the monitor wells at our, our, our uh, Rosita extension area. We are starting to, we're starting to put in our well field as well right now. So... Everything's geared and designed and built to where we get into production in 2023. After following our startup in Texas and expansion of production, we'll be moving to uh, what we call phase two of our overall approach to our, our production profile. And that's uh, executing the uh, Dewey Burdock project. 
This is a project that's located up in South Dakota, uh, right on the border of Wyoming and South Dakota in a historic, uh, the Edgemont Uranium District. And uh, it's been a property that's been in permitting and licensing for quite some time. It has its NRC, Nuclear Regulatory Commission Source Material License, and its EPA permits to uh, start mining. Uh, there's a few uh, legal uh, uh, actions that have to be followed through on. Uh, we recently announced that we received a favorable decision from the uh, uh, D.C. Circuit of Court of Appeals on, uh, the, uh, on challenges to our licensing activities. And uh, as a result, we expect to prevail on all the, any further uh, legal uh, challenges. And uh, we built in uh, starting development of uh, South Dakota, of, of Dewey Burdock sometime in 2024 uh, and starting a production immediately after that. It's a, it's a very good deposit. As you can see from the economics, it's got, it maintains very robust economics. And as a result, it looks it's uh, it makes sense to make it the next follow on to Texas. Right on the heels of that are almost simultaneous. So we've got the Gas Hills project. Uh, it's located in a historic uranium district in, in uh, central Wyoming. And Wyoming is a very favorable place to do business, in my opinion. Uh, we like Texas and Wyoming because they're agreement states. That means that there's minimal federal uh, oversight over the uh, over the licensing process. It's all done at the state. So we can control, we, well, the, the, it's easier to talk to the folks in the state because they're just down the road from us rather than traveling back to Washington, DC. So it, it, it uh, makes for a far more uh, uh, efficient process. This project is, uh, is not new. It's been, it's been around for a while. Uh, I think we're, we're the first ones to take it to become an in-situ recovery uh, property. It had always been looked at pre previously as an open pit, uh, but the conditions are ideal. And it and the reason why I'm confident that we'll be able to, to move it forward as an in-situ recovery is because literally on the fence line, Cameco has, has a fully licensed and approved uh, in-situ recovery project on the same ore body that we're, we're following here as well. So there's a lot of confidence in this project moving forward. And you can see from the economics, it's got good, strong, uh, good economics nearby. And it's uh, so it, it makes sense to move it forward. And we've actually started the permitting process right now. Uh, we, we expect it to the permitting process to be done by 2024, where we can start uh, executing on, on development either in late 2024, early 2025 for production in 2025. So at all, as you can see, we're starting to stack up this, this production profile and, and building out our projects. New Mexico is, is where our storehouse of value is located. As you can see from the, the map, we own uh, within the historic uranium districts where there's significant uranium resources that are well known uh, by, uh, by several institutions that uh, uh, we control a significant part of that, that uh, 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 region. And uh, we have well over 300,000 acres of land that are, or mineral resources are under our control in several, and also several areas we have surface uh, leases as well. Uh, we're continuing to advance, uh, to develop and, and look at these projects, but because New Mexico is in a, a uh, it's in a more difficult regulatory environment than say Wyoming or Texas, it's going to take a little longer to work through that. And that's because there's been a tremendous, you know, a long history of mining, but we've got to work through a, a uh, NRC process. It's a non-agreement state, as well as state uh, permitting process. So we'll, we do expect it to take a little longer. And we've actually started doing our homework and preparing to advance projects over there. Uh, but it will be a follow-on to our other three priority area uh, phases of our development. One area that we expect to be the first to move would be our Crown Point Hosta Butte project. Uh, that is, uh, we just released a, uh, uh, in, back in February 2022, an updated and revised uh, mineral uh, te resource technical report on it, indicating our, our mineral resources of approximately 26.6 million pounds there. This is an area, the reason why I say it'll very likely be the very first one to move is because it's already partial, it's already licensed. Uh, it already has an NRC source material license. It requires some state permitting to be done. 
but most of the activity and most of the, 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 the hard lift on the permitting and licensing work has been done already. And it's a matter of waiting for market conditions. And that license is currently held by uh, another company, uh, but we have good, you know, we, we've been, we, we maintain good relations with that company. And so as a result, we'll be able, we do believe that uh, this will move forward and we'll be seeing some uh, good results out of it once that dis development decision is made. We have investments also in other areas. One of the most exciting investments we have is in Group 11. This is a technology company that looks to uh, develop uh, alternative, uh, using the technology we use in, in situ recovery to go in to uh, recover other metals uh, that are not uranium. Uh, doing, they're currently doing some test work right now, uh, but uh, and using environmentally friendly solvents, not the usual ones that we hear about in the news. And as a result, it's uh, some of the preliminary results get pretty exciting for us. It uh, leverages this uh, technology, and and our expectation is that it'll be something that'll be providing benefits back to uh, Encore uh, and helping us improve the way we mine uh, uranium as well. So as you can see, we've got a strong path for production. Uh, we're working on expansion, we're increasing capacity at Rosita and utilizing our resources at Kingsville to increase our production flow out of Texas, and then ultimately stepping out to South Dakota and Wyoming, uh, and eventually to New Mexico to, to bring up uh, our full portfolio into uh, production at, at event, you know, over a period of time. One of the things we do is we provide fuel for clean, reliable energy. Uh, the and because the, the the new favorite the, the new outlook towards nuclear energy plus several significant U.S. government actions, including the the recent uh, production tax credit, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, as well as the uh, the, the nuclear uh, energy credits uh, that came out of the bipartisan infrastructure bill, uh, we see a lot of support at the government level to see continued and extended nuclear power plant operations in the United States, which support our uh, the country's clean energy goals, but also will, will provide demand uh, for our uranium product. And we're leveraging our experience uh, to uh, our current expertise and expanding that, that uh, our work, our, our uh, technical uh, resources in our company as we go along. All that is to, and we, is to leverage that and to get into production as fast as possible because our current sales contracts and, and uh, as well as the market provides a path to cash flow uh, that allow us to uh, continue to grow based using cash as our main means for financing that growth. We're continuing to look at, we've got, as you would expect, as a company that acquired it, that was built through mergers and acquisition, there are properties that would be considered not long, um, no longer core to our primary uh, production plans, and so we're look. We're in the process of doing a, a divestment of several of these non-core properties. Uh, some of the more re we've actually achieved some of that. We have some currently in progress right now. With that, I'll turn it back over to Dave for questions. Great, great. thank you very much, Paul. Bill, for great uh, presentation as always. So we'd like to kick off the Q&A portion of the webinar right now. And I've reminded everyone online, you can type your uh, questions into the chat box at any time. We'll get to as many as we can. So we are, already have a few questions here. Um, guys, maybe let's start in South Dakota. You know, the, the Zarga merger added Dewey Burdock project, amongst others, to your pipeline. Uh, you mentioned production in 2024. I've always liked this project. It's nice, high grade, uh, and, and you re I, probably only touched the surface of about how much uh, mineralization is there in the ground. Uh, the U.S. Appeals Court recently ruled in favor of the NRC with respect to the license. So what, what does that really mean for the project and what other permits are pending here? So the, uh, the, the D.C. Circuit is a, was a key milestone to get that decision uh, because uh, we have several other permitting actions with EPA that are pending the outcome of the DC circuit. Uh, and so what we're doing right now is as you would expect with any legal case, uh, once a decision is rendered by, by court, there's often an opportunity for an appeal. And, or in this case, because we were, we, the hearing was with a 
panel of the, the D.C. Circuit. If, if you understand how U.S. courts work, a panel is only a small segment of the court to allow the docket to move. Uh, they can appeal to the, the entire uh, appeals court, which is called en banc review. They have 45 days to get that done. Uh, and that is just because they file it doesn't necessarily mean they get get that hearing. So as a result, we've got to kind of wait through that uh, period, but that doesn't stop us from continuing to look at, uh, to work on the projects uh, for, to, uh, with the expectation we'll be executing on developments uh, in sometime in 2023. Uh, and that's what we're doing right now. And, but back to your question, then after that becomes, we have two EPA appeals that are out there. Those are on hold until the DC circuit and they're on the same contentions. So the expectation is that once we get done, uh, once those start moving, we'll prevail on those as well. Uh, but it's a matter that right now this this D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals decision is basically setting the precedent uh, for the rest of the, the, the legal challenges that are out there. So we do expect to have those cleared in, a, in, a for, in the near term foreseeable future and so we can start executing our plan. Mm -hmm. And, and has your strategy changed the way uh, Dewey Burdock might proceed? You know, I think Azarga was looking at the toll processing of uranium at nearby plants. What what would the, the goal be for Encore? Well, right now the, the, the facility is licensed for a full, uh, as, as a full, full uh, plant. So in other words, with dryers and, and precip circuits. We're going to, right now, the, the, the expectation is that we'll be doing a, right now what we've started doing is doing a trade-off study to look at uh, uh, the, the economics of uh, just going ahead and moving forward with an entire full plant rather than just doing a, doing a toll processing and look at other potential opportunities out there that might, might uh, be there for us to look at. Uh, but uh, the, the idea being is, is that we haven't settled on one strategy. The, 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 the strategy you were discussing is in, described in a PEA for Dewey Burdock. And again, that's just one approach to doing it. And as you know, from my his, my experience is that uh, I've always preferred to have all the facilities under our control rather than relying on toll processing. And as a result, we're going to look at alternatives that, uh, to toll processing that will allow us to control our fate. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Uh, Wyoming, very active state uh, in the uranium industry. How quickly do you believe you can develop the Gas Hills project? And then, you know, beyond that, uh, other opportunities in the state, perhaps projects that are that are close by to Dewey Burdock that have uh, some synergies there. Bill, you want to kick that one off and then I can finish? Yeah, it, uh, it's about, uh, we, we view it as uh, really a neck and neck course race with Dewey Burdock. Uh, you know, Dewey Burdock's a lot further along. Uh, in its permitting, uh, albeit with a couple of challenges, uh, and, and uh, Gas Hills is just getting off. But uh, Wyoming being an agreement state, uh, that is, uh, they've taken over most of the federal regulations and permitting activities in the, in the nuclear industry, really puts it ahead. And it's obviously a very pro-mining state with a number of uh, active uranium projects uh, in it. So uh, we will we would anticipate to come in uh, dovetail right right after uh, Dewey Burdock gets going. Uh, but here again, it's a bit of a horse race, so it uh, you know might might come in uh, a little bit sooner than we expect. Yeah, that that pretty much captures it in a nutshell. Okay, great, thank you guys. Uh, Texas, it's going to host your initial production. So the Rosita plant refurbishment, as you mentioned, it seems to be on track for restart in 2023. What's left to do with the plant itself, and are there any impacts that you expect due to supply chain inputs? Uh, being slowed down, such as sulfuric acid or anything like that? Uh, well, the, um, I'll address that and then Bill can fill it. Uh, we do have a key, couple of key components that have been held up by supply chain issues. But to, you have to understand is that we started this work back in 2021 with the expectation to have the flexibility uh, to, with the expect, anticipation that there, you know, nothing was going to survive contact with current markets. And as a result, uh, we have built in enough time to be able to we we have seen uh you know uh, increased prices and and uh et cetera on various materials but what we've done is we've uh taken some unique interesting uh mitigations towards uh uh dealing with those supply chain issues including finding alternative suppliers uh 
from our usual conventional suppliers uh, to be able to get the material and looking at alternative uh, materials as well. And that's been very successful. And that's principally when one talks about uh, like co components like PVC pipe, et cetera. Uh, we, rather than sourcing it from an, uh, one of our traditional manufacturers who can't, couldn't supply us, uh, we've had a result to alternative product, you know, uh, suppliers out of uh, Mexico, et cetera. And we're very fortunate we're close to Mexico. And, uh, but they all meet the ASTM specifications we need. So that, that was an alternative supplier I never would have considered before, but, you know, strange bedfellows, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and for, and we're mitigating all of our chemical supplies with respect to, and just for the record, we don't use sulfuric acid. Uh, we have used uh, a limited amount of, uh, of uh, hydrochloric acid, caustic soda, and hydrogen peroxide in our plant. Uh, but our primary lixivian is oxygen, and uh, there's the, uh, getting liquid oxygen is not as much of an issue as one might think. Uh, but the, uh, uh, we've already started ordering first fills of all the chemicals uh, over a year out from uh, uh, planned startup uh, so that uh, we can get those in the pipeline. The days of just-in-time inventory are long gone. And uh, at least for the time being. And so as a result, we've had to assume that we're having a pre-order, uh, pre-stage, uh, and occasions like we've done with PPC pipe by the entire lot of material we need rather than having it come in piecemeal out of, right out of just-in-time inventory. Right. Right. Things have changed the way the plants operate these days. Yep. Okay. Now, do you need a specific price point to confirm a production decision, or are we pretty much already there? And what might you need uh, before you decide to build additional capacity at Rosita? You want that, Bill? You want me to take it? Uh, well, let's start. You can you can uh, finish off there, but uh, I mean, we're we're committed. Uh, we have contracts to deliver into in 2023. Uh, you know, by virtue of having. Uh, taken over existing licensed plants, uh, very near surface production uh, uh, bodies of uranium. We're in an excellent position to uh, uh, enjoy even current prices, but our, our, we, we have entered into a number of contracts uh, uh, and they're staged, staggered. Uh, we don't want all of our production going to anyone. In general, we'd like to maintain a, you know, a healthy, uh, depending on market conditions, maybe uh, a third to a half exposure to the spot market while maintaining uh, uh, the, the other side of that equation on, on uh, contracts. The contracts tend to have floors and ceilings, uh, inflation indexed, and uh, obviously just suffice it to say we aren't signing contracts where we aren't making a profit. Okay. And I'll add on to that, that uh, uh, to what Bill said, we made our decision. I, I would say that uh, uh, once the uranium price had a had a had a four in front of it, uh, it made that decision really easy to make, and uh, we moved forward ever since. Not turning, we haven't looked back at all. Uh, but as far as expanding capacity, it's going to be not a measure of cost; it's going to be a measure of of uh, need. Uh, as we have production coming in, we're going to need additional capacity uh, as it begins to increase in volume. And so we have, we've already started planning contingencies for further uh, expansion of capacity, although we haven't actually committed the work. Uh, that includes looking at uh, uh, starting up Kingsville Dome as a way to increase capacity and adding drying capacity at Rosita. All those are in the process of being uh, put together uh, as a roadmap but as we speak right now. Okay. So how, how quickly could you put something like Kingsville Dome back into production if you if you so need to? It would probably take, uh, and of course we're guessing at the moment, but it would be probably a six to 12 month to, uh, effort, depending on what has to be done. And currently right now, uh, I have my my, tech, my engineering team going through Kingsville and, and finding out, doing basically a needs list, so to speak, because Kingsville hasn't operated since 2014. Or 2013, and uh, it need there are needs it has to have to to be re, to restart, uh, and so they're doing currently doing that assessment as we speak. Okay, okay, and the the Rosita Extension Well Field, you just finished your monitor wells there. What's the next step in getting that uh, well field ready for production? Well, 
We'll be putting in baseline wells uh, next, uh, which are actually here again to establish the water quality from within the mineralized uh, area. And uh, then it's uh, production and uh, uh, injection and recovery wells. And that well, can happen. Paul could, Paul could probably enlarge upon that, but. Uh... Yeah, so we're, we're already moving forward on that and the uh, I'm putting in the well field to, for the baseline wells and, and the injection and recovery wells. We're also uh, prepping the site for the satellite ion exchange plant that's gonna be put in. Uh, we already got the parts, uh, the, the, we, we have most of the material we need on site already uh, to construct a satellite plant and uh, get that put in place. Uh, and uh, we'll start doing that uh, once the bulk of the well field is done so we have a, a location clear to lay down the pad and then start placing the equipment. Now, I think you touched on this a little bit, you know, explorations and... Yes, there are opportunities out there. There's a number of private opportunities. There's a few public opportunities. Uh, there's collections of assets, single assets. So we're, we're always looking, uh, we're always evaluating. Uh, and uh, right now, exploration uh, per se does not, uh, doesn't really fit into our, our book. In fact, uh, we have several non-core assets that are uh, extremely uh, promising, but... Uh, would, will require some exploration, and it's just something that uh, you know, we're looking to uh, to monetize those and provide value to our shareholders at the same time. Not spend uh, our money on exploration when we we have a pretty healthy uh, chain of uh, projects in front of us, and we really, uh, you know, including a number of projects in Texas to uh, to serve as the spokes, if you will, for the hub and spoke. Uh, so we want to maintain our focus on that. Right. And I guess yeah. one of the notable projects is, is Cibolita, right? You, you've got 90 million pounds, but you just sold that one off. It was non-core. Um, you kept 11.3 million shares to, so you can share in the upside for that. So, so you think more of those are coming. You're going to divest yourself of non-core assets. And would those be anything that are just not ISR amenable or is there other projects? Right. Obviously, our, our interest in, in monetizing them is, is greater on conventional deposits. But as I mentioned, there are a couple of key exploration projects that we, we value quite highly, but uh, don't, don't want to commit the exploration funds to them ourselves. Just not, doesn't, doesn't make sense given our, uh, our pipeline of, of projects. You know, our, our efforts and resources need to be directed at uh, production. Yeah. And, you know, when, when Bill's talking about exploration, he's focusing on like greenfield exploration. We have plans to do what, I guess, for lack of a better phrase, would be brownfield exploration areas. We know we have mineral resources that are local to our, in Texas that uh, are, are a good fit for our production uh, uh, centers. Uh, those will be continuing to to advance uh, as time uh, as we're allowed to with the resources. Keep in mind is that the same res uh, resource such as drilling rigs, et cetera, that we have putting in well fields are the same ones we'll be using for some of those brownfield exp uh, exploration projects. And so we have to, uh, everything comes in its time, so this, for lack of a better phrase. Okay. So and a lot of that, uh, just to follow up, a lot of that's, uh, you know, confirmation and delineation drilling on previous work by others uh, in an area of non-mineralization and and then taking it up to the density of drilling required to actually get it into production. Right. Okay. Now let's talk about New Mexico for a moment. Um, you know, you have several projects uh, and resources in the state. Wyoming is an agreement state. New Mexico is not. Is that fact alone really keeping you from developing some of those assets in the short term? There's there's a number of factors in New Mexico. I, I think uh, you know the primary factor is the uh, indigenous community and uh, creating a, a new working uh, model that uh, involves them in the actual uh, economics of, of the production. And, uh, you know, if you will, a better, a newer, better way of operating. And it's certainly not the industry that uh, uh, was, was so common in, in New Mexico in the 40s, 50s and 60s. So, you know, with the advent of ISL or ISR, it's, it's certainly changed the, the whole dynamics, the whole environmental aspect of, of the industry. And so we, we've got a bit of education and a lot of community relations to do on our end. 
And, uh, and of course, uh, not being in agreement state certainly doesn't uh, speed things up. It does, in fact, slow things down. But uh, so we've got both of those factors uh, going. But at the same time, it's by far and away the, lar the uh, largest accumulation of uranium in the U.S. And we control over 50 percent of the district. Uh, so it's, it's certainly well worth waiting. Right. OK. Um, uranium sales contracts. So you touched on this a little bit earlier, but maybe just remind us of your strategy with respect to covering planned production with offtakes. Are there any other uh, offtakes you require before the Rosita restart? Well, no, the, uh, the, the offtake agreements are going to be coming in. So as Bill mentioned, that uh, we're phasing those in. So we, we like, for example, we, we've got uh, the offtake. And so we do that by managing our book and uh, uh, we, we are seeing a lot more, you know, a bit more, uh, 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 communications between the, the, the utility fuel buyers, the, the prim principal offtake customers, uh, to uh, to look at uh, either you know to to start securing some deliveries out. And I have to say that uh, it's it's been a welcome change, uh, but unfortunately the circumstances that drove it. Uh, but now instead of us trying to to call and set up meetings with utility fuel buyers, now they're calling us. To set them up, so that that's a change, uh, and uh, would expect to be, you know, we would be getting more and more opportunities over the short term to uh, uh, build out our, our contract book beyond, uh, say, you know, in the later years of development. Okay, do you get a sense that the nuclear utilities are becoming more aggressive lately? You know, are they willing to pay more? I think that they've reached a, the conclusion they have to pay more. Uh, the the supply chain issues that are coming that are being fully realized even for uh, uh, material produced out of Kazakhstan are, are manifesting themselves into uh, planning by the utilities to, to 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 basically mitigate the supply risk by going to more secure supply chains in the West. That's why you see uh, more outreach to the U.S. They know that it's not going to be 100 percent of their demand. Uh, but it does provide an ability to receive material without having to go through uh, the, the various complicated ways to avoid uh, the Port of St. Petersburg uh, that uh, are currently being uh, mapped out. And, uh, uh, and also, reliance on state-owned companies have also created issues for the, uh, the utilities because they lose the ability. There, there's no market influences that drive those decisions uh, uh, that were once expected to be there uh, in the past. You know, it's the old McDonald's rule, right? If there's a McDonald's, there won't be a war. Well, that's all been proven to be incorrect. And so uh, those assumptions are being changed in those risk managers. And so we're seeing the utilities are becoming uh, quite a bit more active, uh, aggressive somewhat. Uh, I think right now the, the kind of general consensus at the moment, they're trying to solve their conversion and enrichment problem. Uh, uh, because of dominance of the Russians, uh, and that uh, with those being solved, they'll be coming in to fill in with the material for those those uh, uh, services. Right. Okay. And the U.S. government has finally put out its request for proposals for uranium from U.S. producers. Uh, I believe they're seeking around 2 million pounds a year. How much of an impact do you believe that will have on the uranium industry in the U.S.? Well, that... Uh, RFP was for strictly for a one-time deal, uh, and it was about a million. It's seventy-five million dollars, buying about a million pounds is what they said, uh, and it's got to be an inventory. And there's a lot of reasons why the DOE approach it this way, most of which would take most of the remaining time and then some of this call uh, to explain. But uh, the reality is, is that uh, there's been a shift. It seems like that there's going to be a much broader plan. It's going to be bigger. Uh, the, to create out an entire fuel cycle in the United States, uh, they'll be more significant. But uh, the initial one is, is really, you know, set out some qualifying parameters, which, interestingly enough, uh, Encore's properties do qualify for uh, that uh, are, are coming up. And so uh, it'll be interesting to see the outcomes of that. It will take some material that would be normally available for sale to nuclear utilities off the market, much like what we've seen some of the financial players do. Okay. And do you still have any physical uranium left in your inventory? 
Uh, we have sold our, yes, we, we've sold our uranium off that we had in physical inventory, yes. Okay. okay. But uh, I point out, David, we, uh, we have options on uh, 300,000 pounds. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, at at uh, lower prices. Right. Right. Okay. We're coming to the top of the hour. So just have a couple more uh, corporate questions here. Team, but you recently added Gregory Zerzan to your team as chief administration officer. Could you maybe provide some context behind it? Go ahead, Bill. Yeah. Um, we brought Greg in as, as our uh, General Counsel and also the Chief Administrative Officer. He's, he's got a very unique element of his uh, qualifications. Is uh, well, we feel quite privileged to have him join us. And uh, his financial background uh, gained while uh, handling the derivatives for the Coke uh, Industries is, uh, you know, just icing on the cake, if you will. So uh, we're very happy with that. Okay, great. Uh, can you give us an update on your plans for your Nasdaq listing? Sure, I'd be glad to. Um, you know, we've completed all the applications necessary. Uh, we've been fighting the general tone of the market uh, primarily. Obviously, we need a share consolidation to meet the $3 minimum U.S. Uh, for uh, a number of days trading. However, uh, in the buck and a half area, which we uh, were getting close to uh, a few days ago and we're very close to again today, uh, once we see that stabilized, we'll, we'll be uh, you know ready to pull the trigger. We have full board authorization, uh, management management's discretion to pull the trigger. I would point out that uh, a key step in that is the filing of the 40F, which will be uh, imminently. Okay, okay. And then I guess last question here. You mentioned the Group 11 Technologies. It's a company that's using ISR mining technology for for copper gold in the U.S. Could you give us any color on how that technology is progressing? I'll give you just a bit. Uh, we're we're going to be doing large core diameter drilling. Uh, Group 11 will be uh, this year for additional testing. The first round of testing was done on the Rattlesnake Gold Deposit in Wyoming with uh, really far better results than we'd anticipated, just taking whole core, whole, whole half core uh, and subjecting it to leach test. And, and the results for uncrushed uh, uh, half core was uh, really, as I say, much better than we'd expected and very encouraging. So now we're going to get a larger diameter core uh, probably PQ, possibly S, and uh, conduct actual testing on uh, the the fresh core as opposed to core that's been half sawn and smaller diameter. Uh, but uh, very, very exciting about that. We're already starting to do permitting for uh, uh, the, the technology applications to actually do an in situ uh, five spot or a push pull test in a five spot. So this next round of testing is very, very key to its success. Uh, point out that, uh, you know, there are a number of uh, in situ operations around the world that have actually operate on gold, about a half a dozen of them. Unfortunately, they've used very toxic materials like cyanide and uh, have had some real issues. Those were in Russia in the Ural Mountains and uh, also uh, chlorine in Azerbaijan, but uh, which happens to turn into mustard gas if your conditions aren't quite right. So uh, we're, we're using a novel uh, lixiviant that's uh, very environmentally friendly, actually benign chemistry. So. Uh, taking the in situ uh, coupled with the benign chemistry that has better kinetics than cyanide. We're, we're very excited about that potential. Okay. Well, guys, why don't we wrap it up there? So Bill, Paul from Encore Energy, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, David. Thank that you sounds well. great. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. A reminder that Red Cloud Securities, we will be back Wednesday afternoon. Colby will be sitting down with Enviral Global. Enviro Global. That's August 31st at 2 p.m. Eastern. So have a great day, everyone. Thank you.